Amen. Oh, let Jesus be our cornerstone today. Look, it is um, trying to speak into this environment is difficult, uh, incredibly difficult. Some of you are tired and don't want to hear another thing about all that's going on. Um, you're looking for an escape. And if you're looking for an escape from engaging with the world, from engaging the world with truth and justice and love, then you're going to want to avoid Jesus. Jesus compels us to engage our world. And so today, in some ways, maybe it's a let me step back and get away from all that, but our eyes have to be on, Lord, how do we engage our world? Others of you are wondering what box I'm going to fit in. All right, let's face it. I don't look like the kid who grew up in New York City with friends since the time I was born who were from all different cultures, all different races, all around the world. Um, We're all trying to figure out what box are they going to fit in. Some of you are wondering if I'll get it and understand your pain. Others of you are wondering if I'll get it and see all the things that are happening in our nation, those who are trying to just cause upheaval and stir up trouble just because that's what they do. We live in a culture that is about weighing and judging sound bites and turning people on or off based on whether we like what they're saying, changing the channel based on whether we like what they're saying. And I'm just here trying to have a conversation. That's why I wish we could be all sitting in the same room today. Uh, Conversations are messy. Um, They're imperfect. And I'm sure there are some things today that I will say that aren't necessarily right, uh, because I am fallible. Um, There are things I will leave out that you will consider to have been incredibly essential and I should have said it and I didn't say it and why didn't I say it? It's a conversation, not a television show. We're a church family and families are the best place to have transforming conversations. Sometimes those conversations are going to sting, but when we're talking face-to-face and eye-to-eye, that's when we get real clarity, the kind of clarity you don't get anywhere else. Um, I've spent my week, I determined right at the beginning that I was going to spend my week listening, trying to listen to my black brothers and sisters and have conversations with them so that I could come alongside and understand the hurt that they are feeling right now. And you know what? There you go. Erase right now. This isn't just about the pain of right now. Right now is a particular moment. Uh, What happened to George Floyd, the man does not deserve to die. What happened was evil and wrong. And that has sparked another moment. But this isn't just about right now. This has been boiling and stewing and going on for generations. And we need to recognize that. And so I set out this week to not make statements, but to listen and have conversations. Can I suggest you do that too? And maybe I'm a little late to say this to you, but can I suggest that you stop posting your opinions and solutions, your gripes and complaints, your pet peeves or anything else, and that instead you go out and talk to some of your black brothers and sisters and listen and try to understand before you form your opinions. That you base your opinions on conversations with real people, and not just one or two, but many. Let those conversations help you form a picture of our world, um, not, let those conversations form your picture, not that flat screen illuminated light show on your wall with surround sound. Because no matter how high the resolution is on your television or how wonderful your surround sound system is, it is not giving you a clear picture of what's happening in people's lives, in the lives of your brothers and sisters in our church family. And no matter how great your surround sound system is, it is nothing like being surrounded with real people and talking with them and listening to them and trying your best to understand. 
I think you might be shocked with some of the things you hear from your own brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of your church family here. And I just want to share a, a, a few takeaways as we work into the message for the morning and into what God's Word is going to say to us this morning. I want to just share a couple takeaways from, from my conversations this week. And look, I'm not going to make apologies about being a little bit raw for me. Um, me being raw maybe isn't the same as others being raw, but I'm going to try and just let my heart be on the table here. Um, first takeaway. What does it mean when people say black lives matter? And, and I know some of us knee-jerk react to that and say, well, all lives matter. Yeah. If my wife walks into our house crying and, and, and cries out, my life matters, I'm not going to jump off the sofa and puff up my chest and say, well, my life matters too. I'm going to run to her. I'm going to put my arms around her. And I'm going to ask her, what happened? Why? Why, do you, why are you saying that? Why do you feel the need to say that? Because I want to understand, because I love her. And that's what we need to be doing here too. Not knee-jerk reacting and saying, oh, no, no, every life matters. No one's saying every life doesn't matter. Well, there's probably some people out there saying that. But your brothers and sisters are saying black lives matter. Two, also, and it needs to be said, yeah. You've got brothers and sisters in your church family. I'm not some reporter sitting in a news station. They're not some people you don't know on a screen, right? Your brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, who have been told to get out of neighborhoods and never come back because they're black, who have been followed through stores, Dragged into back rooms, suspected of shoplifting just because they're black. Who have been treated like all their achievements and their work and the place they've gotten to with their companies is only not because their hard work and their intelligence, but because the government gave it to them in a handout. You've got black brothers and sisters who get ignored at, in meetings, whose opinions get disregarded. You know how when we dedicate kids here in our church family, we all stand up in this room and we say, yes, I commit myself to be part of raising them and helping them learn how to follow Jesus and I'm going to join with them in their hurts and in their sufferings and in their pains and all that they feel. Our youth group had a great conversation on Friday night. Our kids are confused and hurting. Our kids, some of them are wondering, wait a minute, I'm black, does that mean I'm bad? And some are wondering, wait, I'm white, does that mean I'm racist? They don't know what to do. Our kids, not some out there people, not somebody through your TV screen, our family, We need to listen. We've got to go have conversations and listen. And look, recognize right now that emotions are raw, so we need to make room for people's anger. Hear me when I say that. Make room for people, as you're talking with them, about deep things that they've been feeling, make room for that anger that may come up. Maybe they're not going to say everything the right way or the perfect way or with complete self-control. Right? And I'm not talking about, for those of you who might object to that, I'm not talking about making room for anarchy. And I'm not talking about making room for violence or vandalism or looting. In Psalm 137.9, David prays a prayer. He's talking to God. And he's so mad at his enemies. David is so fed up. He's like, I envy the guy who gets to smash your babies against rocks. Yeah, it's in the Bible. That is raw emotion. And you know what? It is safe to bring that raw emotion to God. In fact, that's probably the only really safe place to bring that raw emotion. 
But we as children of God need to also be safe places for our brothers and sisters to bring their raw emotions and express their hurts and their pains. And so many times over this past week, you know, I'd start out conversations and at first it would be tenuous and is it safe to talk? Um, And I get that. I know. I understand. But We'd come to the end and my brothers and my sisters would say, you know, this has been, I feel relief. I feel lighter. I feel just from having talked, just knowing I can talk and express these things I feel. Because I usually feel like I can't, even in church, even with my church family, the people of God. That should never be. That's not diversity. Diversity we can do much better as a church. Fourth thing, or third thing, that I've taken away from this week is that silence hurts our black brothers and sisters as much and maybe more than blatant racism does. And I don't mean we need to go out there and grab megaphones and start shouting in the streets, or even necessarily you got to go and march in a protest. I mean, call Ask, how are you? How are you feeling in all this? I can't imagine what this context all feels like for you. And I'm trying to wrap my mind around it, but how are you? Tell me your story. When we don't do that, when we're silent, we'll sit there and we'll post our things, but we're not actually calling and talking to our brothers and sisters. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Take the time to see them. I've got a scar on my forehead here that's a little over an inch long. Um, You probably can't even see it. Uh, If I rub it, you can start to see the traces of the line. And it it happened 40 years ago plus. My father accidentally uh, threw me headfirst into a tree, right where a branch had broken off. So it was all jagged and rough and right into the tree. I was in second grade. But I still find myself sometimes just sitting and, and, and rubbing that scar. I feel it. It's there. You don't see it. The wound is healed, but it's there. And I could still remember hitting the tree. And I could still remember the blood on my hand. And I can still remember being in the hospital and the blue washcloth they used to cover my eyes. I could still remember that crazy looking needle that I got a glimpse of before the blue washcloth came in. I still remember the poke of the needle into my head. I still remember the sticker they gave me for being courageous, although I doubt I really was. I remember it sitting there on my bunk bed for years. I still remember it. Scars linger with us, and the scar of slavery still lingers in our culture. Maybe you don't see them. Maybe you think, oh, the wounds have healed. But we still feel them, and they're felt by those who are affected by them. Some people don't get that. I mean, we sit here and say to ourselves, look, slavery ended in our country 157 years ago. That's a couple lifetimes ago. And look at all the progress we've made. And many people I've talked to this week have said, I'm so grateful for all the progress that's been made. But for the 244 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, Picture this. White men would walk into the homes of black families and tear them apart, drag them across the sea, treat them as animals, make them work, brutalize them, suppress them, create laws to suppress and oppress them, use law enforcement to suppress and oppress them, count them as barely even half a legitimate person. Listen, our nation is still affected. Our travel, our cargo trade is still affected by the rail system. The rail system was put in place 36 years before slavery was abolished. And the the effects of it are still felt today in business and travel and everything else. Look at the roads in Boston that we drive through and, and people curse every day trying to get where they got to go and it's crazy and it's who designed all this. Well, that's the repercussions of things that were done 
two lifetimes ago and more. Of course, we still carry the scars and are affected by the scars of the racism that shaped our country for centuries. Of course we do. So recognize this is a bigger issue. I'm hearing my brothers and sisters say this to me. This is a bigger issue than just individual encounters with the police. It goes way beyond policing, and that's, that's part of it. But we also should stop and say what we're expecting of our police is ridiculous. Expecting them to be therapists and um, social workers and marriage counselors and detectives and friends and neighborhood happy guys and ready at a moment's notice to step in and, and stop violence with, and meet it with force and determine quickly. And it's unfair. And so, yes, there are evil and bad people. But there's also just whole ways of doing things. That's what I'm hearing people talk to me about. That you and I need to open up and recognize and hear and listen and step back and think about it from, a, from Christ's perspective. What would God say into these situations? Because the thing I hear my brothers and sisters talking about most beyond the instances of violence and, and racism that are horrific is an inherited mindset in, in all races that is stuck with us because racism contributed to the way our culture is shaped and, and that still echoes and reverberates today. That doesn't just go away with time. Time does not heal wounds. It doesn't. Do you remember Weebles? I grew up, I was born in 1970. Um, it was a fun little toy we had as kids. The fun little theme song, Weebles Wobble, but they don't fall down. Something like that. And uh, no matter what you did to them, you couldn't turn them upside down. They just wouldn't stay that way. They kept always going back to the way they started. Things just kept always going back to the way they were. You could kick them, you could spin them, you could throw them, toss them, shake them. No matter what you did, they just always kind of ended up the same way they were. Our world feels that way. Our world feels like a weeble for a lot of our brothers and sisters. All the social upheaval and unrest and the, the things that have been done over the, throughout history, it just keeps feeling like things end up back where they were and never really change. And that's true for systems. That's also true for us. <laughs> it's true for me. Things in my life I try to change and make progress on, and then I weeble right back to where I was and started. I'm guessing that's probably true for you too. So what does it take to turn the weebles upside down, transform them so they're not weebles anymore? What will that take to transform our world so it's not weebly anymore? You know, one of the things the early Christians got accused of? They got accused of turning the world upside down. Could anybody validly accuse us of that today? The story where that happens is in Acts chapter 17. And you can go there, I'll just share it with you. You've got Paul and Silas, who are two Jews, and Timothy, who's a half Jew. He's half Jew, half Greek. And God miraculously called them to expand the gospel. They've traveled across the sea, and they're what is in, in current day, modern day Greece. Uh, at that point, the Romans had taken over everything. But, um, and they go to this town. God leads them to this town called Thessalonica. It's right by um, a major trade route. And so it is a wealthy city. It's a city of people who travel a lot. Um, people, uh, very strong Greek history, um, but also Roman culture there too. Proud people, wealthy. They knew they were savvy, very urban. And so these two and a half Jews walk into this culture and they start sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus and how Jesus transforms our lives to wash away our sin and give us a new relationship with God, how God created us to be like him, how everyone is made in God's image, and that when you step into this relationship with God through Jesus, 
He tears down all the dividing walls. There's no more Jew or Greek. There's no more slave or free. There's no more male or female in God's eyes. Everyone, all those societal structures get ripped down and this new transformation happens. What identifies us now is sons and daughters of God. That sits above everything else. And it revolutionizes some of the people there in that city. Some Jewish people begin to follow Jesus. A bunch of Greek people begin to follow Jesus. It even points out a bunch of women even began to follow Jesus. And people started getting upset and angry because it was turning the culture upside down. Because in that culture, there were systems and this is the way things are supposed to go. And, and you bring this in and introduce this gospel, this incredible news about Jesus, and people start acting differently and being differently and it got everybody upset. And so they, they go, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they, they help them kind of get away. But they arrest the officials of the city and the Jewish leaders go and they arrest this guy named Jason whose house everybody was using to meet in. They drag him to the city leaders and they say, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also and Jason has received them and they're acting against the decrees of Caesar saying there's another king, Jesus. You know, Caesar in that day was king, but also it was like a cult to Caesar. He was treated as like he was divine. And so everything operated on that level. And then in comes Jesus. And it turns the world upside down. It turns their culture upside down. All the things that they'd done for so long, for gen generations and generations now, get turned upside down, transformed and changed in light of the truth of Jesus. And so they take some money from Jason because government systems never change. And they tell him, okay, get out of here. We've got your money as security. You know, keep it down. What is it about the gospel that turns our world upside down? In that setting right there, it challenged the Jewish culture. The Jewish people in that city get upset because the message of the gospel says, that you're not God's people just because of the culture you were born, the ethnicity you were born into. The, you're not God's people just by birthright, but through Jesus. And that made them say, wait a minute, no, we're special. We're specially God's people. You can't, and Paul, the gospel says, anyone can be a child of God. All were created to be sons and daughters of God. And so that threatens their special place in the world. And then for the Greek culture, it's a culture where all the gods determine everyone's station in life and there's nothing you can do about it. You just accept the, the gods have set me for this fate. This is who I am. So I have this job or I have that job or I have this amount. This is my place in, in social status and that's your place in social status. The gods did it. And the gods every day decide who's going to live and who's going to die. And it's, oh, the gods do it. And the best you can do is try and bribe the gods every day to get what you want and to get protection from them. That's the best you can hope for in a relationship with God. In walks the gospel and says, no, everyone's created in God's image. He loves us and he is intimately involved in our lives and desires relationship with us. He doesn't send out a bunch of rules you got to follow so he doesn't zip eliminate you. He wants to be with you and walk with you, to shelter you, protect you, pull you under his wings, and love you, and transform you. The gospel turns everyone's worlds upside down because of what it says. There's no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female, no slave or free. We are all God's sons and daughters now. And in that way, the gospel eviscerated the systems it invaded. It didn't pass legislation, although legislation reform is good, it eviscerated them from the inside because the only way things truly change is from the inside. So Paul tells Philemon, who had a slave, Onesimus, who would run away, he tells him, well, Onesimus is now a brother in Christ. He's come to Christ. So you should receive him back and not just don't punish him, but receive him back as a brother. Well, what does it mean? He's my slave, he's my brother, he's my slave, he's my brother. It eviscerates the whole system when you treat the people you used to see as your slaves, as your brothers now. It just eliminates even the need for rules. They're my brother. I love them. He tells husbands their responsibility is to love and honor and listen to their wives. Hear them. What, 
What would that do in a culture where men never had felt any obligation to do anything with their wives? Just to use them the way they wanted to use them and demand things from them the way they wanted to demand things from them. He didn't make new laws about marriage. He just presented Jesus as a new standard to be married by. A selfless standard of love to be married by that eviscerates all of our petty nonsense or any rules you could make up for how to treat one another. The gospel is more powerful than any law book. The Holy Spirit written on our hearts is more powerful than any rules. Look, we've changed law after law in our country, and it doesn't change the racist ideas and feelings that are in our hearts. The law never could, and who knows that better than Christians? Who knows that better? We have an entire Bible demonstrating to us that what we need is a heart transformation. We need repentance, a change of direction and a change of mind, a change of the way we think, and only Jesus can do that in us. Only Jesus can give us a reason to do it because Jesus' death and resurrection sets us free from fear and selfish concerns. That's why only Jesus can do it. Because what drives all of this is our fear and our selfishness and Jesus' death and resurrection and the gift of salvation he gives us sets us free from that fear. So now I can live in that freedom. And that's what happened in Thessalonica. Paul says, we know God choose you, chose you. We saw him turn your lives upside down and shake you free from sin because, and he points to three specific things. Uh, let's just read um, 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10 together just to get a feel for it. He says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived alongside of you for your sake, and you became imitators of us, and of the Lord, for you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering and the, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So here are the signs that the gospel has powerfully grabbed us in in the world we live in. One, the work of faith. He says in verse 3, the work of faith, not a feeling of faith, not just a deep belief, a work of faith. And how did, how did that show in their lives? It wasn't that something powerful happened at an altar and they had warm, fuzzy feelings. It was that they went out and started sharing the gospel and trying to tell others about this revolutionary gospel that tore down every wall. And that's how he knew they had a work of faith that they were doing. So Paul would go places and find out they'd already been there. He'd go places to preach the gospel and find out the Thessalonians had already beaten them there and presented the gospel. It was just amazing what was happening with these people because the gospel grabbed hold of their hearts. The second sign, their labor of love, not their feelings of love, not their feelings of affection. Oh, it's so nice to have all these diverse people together sitting in our room, but their labor, they worked at love. They worked at embracing one another and being a community of believers who came from all different backgrounds. Backgrounds where some some of them were raised to despise each other and consider each other dirty and unclean. And they overcame all of that. They worked at love to overcome all of that. And not just that, but they worked to let go of the culture and the norms and the way everybody else did things. Because it was basically the economy runs on Caesar. You honor Caesar. He's a God. He's a deity. You have to be part of these things. Go to the meetings, whatever, in order to be part of this. And they turned their backs on all that and they suffered for it. But it was how they demonstrated they loved God. They turned their backs on all that cultic worship. And it cost them dearly. And that leads to the last sign that the gospels really gripped my heart and your heart. A steadfast hope. 
a hope, an enduring hope that doesn't go away. Um, right from the moment they embraced Jesus, it was, life became more difficult. We don't turn to Jesus to escape from the difficulty of life. We turn to Jesus so that we have the power to engage this life, this world. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit filled them with an indomitable spirit that could not be crushed. And that's why they were turning the world upside down. Their work of faith, their labor of love, and their unbreakable hope that Jesus gave them. They were going and sharing the story. And you know it was a unique story. Because Paul says when we travel other places and we find out you've already been there, we don't have to tell them the story of how you embraced us and accepted us even though we were two and a half Jews. They tell us that story because that story stood out in their minds as a unique thing that God would bring together these Jews and these Greeks, these Jews and these Gentiles, and, and form a new people. It stood out in their mind enough that when they went places and talked about the gospel, they said, and look what it did. It tore down these walls between us. Not only did it tear down those walls, it tore down our practices of acting like the rest of our culture, and we began to run counter to it, to run according to God's culture. That's, it stood out, and that's what they grabbed hold of. Our gospel, the gospel Jesus has given us, the gospel, the good news about Jesus, can turn our world upside down. It is turning our world upside down. But before it can turn our world upside down through us, it has to turn us upside down. Has the gospel turned you upside down? The gospel. Racism is a sin. As followers of Jesus, we hate sin. And so we hate racism. But let's recognize that racism, like every other sin, has its blatant forms that are obvious and its subtle forms that are easy to miss. You know, I might not be engaged in full-blown lustful behaviors, but that doesn't mean that lust doesn't hide in the corners and crevices of my heart. I may not engage in violent anger, but that doesn't mean that anger doesn't hide in the shadows of my soul. And my goal, our goal as Christians, is to ask Jesus to invite him, Holy Spirit, come in and wash clean the crevices, the nooks and crannies of my heart. Search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts today. Try me, my Savior. Cleanse me from every sin. See if there's any wicked way in me and wash it out. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Today is the day to examine our hearts, to ask God to examine our hearts of any wicked way that might be in us, in particular racism. And if there's any hiding in the shadows of our souls, Jesus, please wash it out. Give me a heart for my brothers and my sisters your people made in your image. You know, look, our, our black brothers and sisters will tell you that racism is not exclusively a white person's problem. It goes in every direction. Every one of us, when we're driven by selfishness and fear, will grab at things to differentiate us from others so that we can dehumanize others and then not care about them, but be able to just get our way. That's how we work when we're lost in sin. Jesus wants to turn you and me upside down and shake off that selfishness and that fear so that we can be truly free. And you know that's happening. You know the gospel's called you and it's gripping your life when you engage in the work of faith. It means taking this gospel and bringing it to the people around you. A gospel that tears down every wall, that looks for those walls and actively tears them down that listens to understand so that it can tear them down. You know it's gripping your life when you labor at love, when you embrace those who might be other to you, when you reach out, when you call them, when you listen with the intent of understanding, when you see into other people's eyes instead of viewing their lives through pixels and dots, when you work and labor at love, when we cling to Jesus as our hope for final justice and healing, there's going to be persecution for everyone who hopes in Jesus this way, who really embraces the gospel and gets turned upside down and then begins to be part of this wave of what Jesus is doing to turn the world upside down. There, everything, all the systems of our day will resist it, will fight against it. Everything that wants to just keep the economy rolling, that wants to just keep 
those who are comfortable, comfortable. Um, our world will hate and fight against anything that tries to turn it upside down, to turn sin upside down and shake it loose. It doesn't want to be turned upside down. But it's going to be. And those who are living the gospel, who are gripped by the gospel, will be part of that turning because of faith, love, and hope. Again, I want our kids to hear me. Our teenagers and young adults. Those of you who right now just are really struggling to see if there's any hope. Because for you, a lot of this is maybe fresh because of your age. There is hope. There is absolute hope. It's not in people. It's not in systems. It's not in laws or rules. It's a living hope in Jesus. He truly transforms us. He enables us to love. He enables us to have faith. He enables us and gives us a hope that he will return. And he will bring healing, restoration, and ultimate justice. We can put our hope there in him and then live free no matter what anybody does to us. We can live in the freedom that Jesus has given us that no one can take away. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing.